Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness is the newest entry into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but does this mark the triumphant return of Sam Raimi? Let's find out. Spoiler warning for Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. If you want a spoiler free review, you can actually click the link in the description and that will take you to my TikTok page where you can see my spoiler free thoughts on that film as well as a few other movie related things. And the reason I wanted to do a spoiler free review of this movie is because I honestly don't really think I can be cagey about my thoughts with this movie because I have a lot and I mean a lot to say about this movie. So let's dive in. First off, I think it's important to kind of lay out my context regarding my relationship with Doctor Strange and his portrayal in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Strange has long been my favorite character in the MCU. Although I didn't love the first Doctor Strange film, I actually saw a lot of possibilities there, and I think it was a really excellent foundation for growth, which is what exactly we were given. Because every time I saw him in subsequent sequels, I was thrilled. And it was great seeing not only his powers evolve, but him as a character evolve, not just in the movies, but also in that great episode of What If? Which was one of the many reasons why I was immeasurably excited to see this movie when it was first announced. Scott Derrickson, who directed the first film, was originally slated to direct this film as well, and he sounded like a perfect choice to helm what was originally described as Marvel's first horror movie. And you guys know me, I'm a horror nut, and not just the MCU, but Marvel movies in general have been a huge part of my life for so long, and the idea that I would see these two loves of mine collide along with my favorite MCU character seemed like a dream come true. Erickson, who had worked on Sinister, which is an excellent horror movie seemed truly like the perfect fit, which was why initially I was so disappointed when he was announced to be leaving the project due to creative differences. But then I kind of had this real whiplash reaction because the director that was announced to be filling in the director's chair was none other than Sam Raimi, who obviously, yes, is known for his work on the Spider-Man films, movies that I grew up with, but also the Evil Dead trilogy and so much more. I genuinely cannot think of a better fit to pass on this torch creatively. And my excitement for this movie didn't decrease at all. In fact, it maybe even increased with the prospect of having Raimi involved. And thankfully, Raimi proves to be the undeniable highlight of this film. All of the Raimi-isms that you would expect to find are there, all of them. Raimi, as a filmmaker, has such a distinctive style and directorial vision that completely shines through in this movie to the point where this is hands down, in my opinion, the best directed Marvel movie. Yes, Infinity War and Endgame are their own kind of directorial achievement, sheerly in regards to the scale of those films, but stylistically, it's not even close, it's this movie. And that's been a huge issue with a lot of Marvel movies recently, right? Like, they have a very homogenous style and tone, and a lot of these movies feel very similar from a stylistic perspective, which is precisely why I genuinely could see a lot of people hate aspects of this film, because it is unabashedly a Sam Raimi movie through and through. And if you like his work, awesome. If you can't stand the stamp that he typically puts on his movies, I've you know, got bad news for you. But for me, I was so thrilled to see that this film does have a lot of grit to it and doesn't shy away from leaning into its horror roots. No, yeah, this movie isn't you know, gonna petrify you. I would argue even the Evil Dead movies wouldn't. And yeah, this being a Disney film, I also wouldn't expect that here either. But there are more than a few moments in this movie where the violence and is pretty disturbing. There's genuinely some disturbing imagery in this movie that surprised me. I'll get into that more in a bit, but Jesus, that scene of Wanda versus the Illuminati, I mean, dude, it goes places, man, that we haven't seen from Marvel. Sure, yeah, Moon Knight has leaned into the horror aspects a bit more, but this dives right in. This is Marvel's darkest movie to date, which, you know, automatically, yes, doesn't necessarily make it a good movie, but it's certainly a breath of fresh air, considering a lot of Marvel's outputs tend to, you know, kind of be pretty uniform. Absolutely, of course there are outliers in that, but generally, even on a visual level, this movie really stands out from the pack. But hey, that's all well and good, but let's dive into the characters of this movie, because I do think... Unfortunately, that's where this film begins to falter a bit. Something I was really looking forward to seeing in this movie is Doctor Strange kind of getting what's coming to him, right? 
In the first film, Strange tampers with time after he was explicitly told not to. In Infinity War, he makes this impossible sacrifice, which, you know, although did end up saving humanity and was quite literally their only option, the fact of the matter is people were negatively affected by that. And I was curious to see how that would play out. And yeah, to make matters worse, Strange also tampers with the multiverse in ways that were not intended with No Way Home. Of course, yeah, all masters of the mystic arts draw their powers from other dimensions dimensions within the multiverse, but what he did in that movie seemed to break some shit. So I was looking forward to seeing Strange face the consequences of his actions and tampering with things that are not meant to be tampered with, even as a master of the mystic arts. And he does in this movie, you know, kind of. See, Strange really learns this lesson of the dangers of manipulation and manipulating reality and the multiverse to your will sort of by proxy of others. Throughout this movie, there is a real point made to critique Strange on how all of these different versions of him and the different multiverses, they all kind of do the same thing. They all tamper with things they aren't meant to, and they tempt fate, which in some versions of Strange cause reality to collapse in on itself. We even saw Strange learn this lesson in What If, which was, you know, by far the best episode of that series. It's literally not even close. But in this version of Strange, the 616 version, I don't really think he faces a lot of consequences as a result of this film, but also with No Way Home. I think because of Wanda, who I will get to, he does learn these lessons. But I would have preferred to see him actually have to deal with the consequences of his actions specifically, and not just hers. And in this movie, unfortunately, I just don't really think that we get that. What we do get in this movie, however, is a ton of cool magic. Hey, yeah, I know it's pretty surface level stuff, but I was really looking forward to seeing Strange evolve as a sorcerer after that first film. Because in that movie, he's a beginner. He doesn't really know the spells, and the magic that we see is pretty rudimentary. Then flash forward to Infinity War, we see him begin to use all of these weird and cool spells at his disposal, which was exciting to see. And thankfully that trend continues in this movie. There are so many great moments and weird moments where Strange uses his magic, and it's kind of everything I wanted to see from a Doctor Strange movie. Hell, at one point he uses music to fight, like musical notes. It's odd and bizarre. I loved it. But hey, he's not the only magic wielder in this film because we also have the Scarlet Witch herself, Miss Wanda Maximoff, who makes her return after her television show, WandaVision. And in that show, we really did see Wanda go on this emotional journey, right? Her character had such a clear arc throughout that show, one that showed that she was rejecting her past in favor of creating this new reality where she wouldn't have to confront her trauma and truly grieve for what was taken from her. And at the end of the show, she finally understands what she is doing to others and that this pain that she is actively avoiding, she's just inflicting on others. But that kind of seems to just be thrown out the window in this movie because Wanda is straight up the villain of this film. And hey, I know what you're going to say, and it's that in this movie, Wanda is explicitly stated to be influenced by this book, this Dark Hold, which offers her kind of the same choice that she had to make in WandaVision, which really does bring me to my biggest problem with Wanda in this movie, and that's due in part to a couple of things. First and foremost, I didn't really think it was made clear enough that her actions were being influenced as a result of the Dark Hold, because in the film the book is destroyed at one point, which I assume would, you know, kind of release its hold on her. It doesn't. She continues on this crusade of darkness and anger and revenge to get what she wants. Then by the end of the movie, she realizes her mistake and yes, sacrifices herself because she recognizes the monster that she has become. The same monster that explicitly she states throughout the movie that she isn't. And I just found a lot of this to be kind of regressive or at minimum redundant. Wanda goes on a very similar emotional journey in WandaVision. And even if her actions were in this movie completely dictated by the Dark Hold, she still has a very similar character arc as she did in that show. Yeah, sure, in this we get to see the Scarlet Witch in full effect, the same being that Agatha Harkness was so fearful of, and we see why, because she fucking wipes the floor with the Illuminati, which was one of the most shocking things in this movie. We'll get to the cameos themselves, but when she made Black Bolt's head fucking pop, genuinely one of the most surprising moments of any comic book movie I've ever seen, Wow. But hey, little side note, that moment actually got me a little excited about the potential of maybe having Deadpool in the MCU, because if we can do that, 
Who's to say that we can't get, you know, Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe or at least kind of the MCU version of that? Hell, bring it on. So although, yeah, you know, the 12 year old kind of inside of us all made me love seeing Wanda just completely wreck shop. Even though that is the case, I did find her character arc in this movie to be kind of treaded ground, and I genuinely wouldn't be surprised at all if Scarlet Witch fans, or WandaVision fans for that matter, who go see this movie are disappointed by her in this film. I'm really curious to see how that plays out, actually. But a character who is in this movie, who I'm very confident will not be received well, is the character of America Chavez, who I was very much so looking forward to seeing in this movie. And I want to be explicitly crystal clear, has absolutely nothing to do with the actress in this role. She does as good of a job as you could really ask for with what she is given, but the fact of the matter is, she's not given much. Her character I found to be very flat and is the definition of one dimensional. Her role in this film pretty much begins and ends at being a MacGuffin, a plot device. And I was really looking forward to seeing her establish herself as a potential new member of the Avengers or even one day becoming a part of the Young Avengers or the West Coast Avengers. But she's really poorly developed in this movie and her character arc I found to be very cliche and a real missed opportunity. See, the backstory that she is given in this film is that in her reality. She unwillingly unleashed her powers, which resulted in the death of her mothers. And because of that, she is very fearful of her abilities and does not know how to control her powers because she doesn't want to inflict the same pain on anyone else like she did her parents. Which is pretty similar, actually, to what we see Wanda go through not only in Age of Ultron, but also in Civil War. Wanda and America are two characters of incredible power, which leads to them accidentally hurting people. And the movie doesn't really make a point to acknowledge this or have it incorporated into either America or Wanda's arc throughout the film really at all, which I thought was odd and a bit of a missed opportunity, especially because to me it seemed kind of obvious, but I guess not. I hope in the next project that she's in, her character is developed more because I found her inclusion in this film to be pretty disappointing. But hey, she is not the only character introduced into the MCU because as was pretty heavily rumored before the release of this film, Boy, does this movie have some cameos. And before we actually dive into the cameos of this movie, I've actually got to say, the thought that this film would be overwhelmed by cameos is something that really worried the hell out of me because that's just something I'm not really interested in, really at all. Toby and Andrew in No Way Home is really the line where I kind of draw in regards to the self-referential cameos. And by that I mean, in the future, if there is a Cyclops cameo. That's not something I have a problem with, the character of Cyclops being in the MCU. I'm looking forward to that, actually. But if it's James Marsden's Cyclops, that's just not really something I'm interested in seeing. The MCU has so many corners of the Marvel Universe that have not been explored, believe it or not. And within this universe, it seems weird to compromise and to have this new version of these characters just be with actors that we've seen before in these roles. And it's really just seems like it's in an effort to get fans to go, hey, look, it's, it's that thing. It's that thing I recognize. Look at that. And I desperately want these movies to cast new actors or to incorporate actors that we've already seen in this universe, in these roles, and make me care about these versions of the characters. And don't just have it be driven primarily by fan service. All that to say... We kind of get a mixed bag of the two, honestly, because not only do you have John Krasinski in this movie as Reed Richards, but you also have Patrick Stewart as Professor Xavier, and boy do I have some thoughts. You know, let's go cameo by cameo. First off, we've got Black Bolt portrayed by Anson Mount, the same actor that portrayed him in that impossibly bad Inhumans TV show. Genuinely surprised he's in this thing, considering again how bad that series is. I figured, and I assumed, that Marvel would just kind of want to distance themselves and wash their hands of that and stay as far as humanly possible away from that series, but <laughs> hey, the dude dies in spectacular fashion, so it doesn't really seem like it's going to matter much. Like I said, excellent death. No notes. Up next, you got Captain Marvel, and it was great to see Lashana Lynch back as Maria Rambo. And I don't think we're gonna see too much of her in the future, considering Monica Rambo seems to be kind of taking the role on of the next Captain Marvel, or at least a kind of adjacent Captain Marvel. Regardless, it was great to see her back, and I was frankly expecting Iron Man or Namor in her place, so it was a great surprise, and I think she's a great choice. Up next, you got Baron Mordo, who's 
not as much of a cameo. He's kind of expected to be in this movie and he has a bit of a larger role, but I would like to see more of him in the future. Strange alludes to Mordo trying to kill him at one point, which is just something that we've not seen, and I would like to see that. And he seems like a great person to go up against Strange because he has been doing explicitly what Mordo was against him doing in the first film. Yeah, throw another villain in a future movie because I don't want to just see Sorcerer fight Sorcerer again, throw in somebody else, but I think Mordo would be a fantastic antagonist in a sequel. After this, we have Peggy Carter in a live action Captain Britain. This one wasn't too much of a surprise because she was teased in the poster of this film, but I thought she was cool. I did kind of have to laugh a little bit because she goes up against Wanda with her shield, and I was like, hey man, that shield that you're throwing is not gonna help oh yeah okay she got cut in half oh, wow but still bottom line it was really cool to see a character who was in a disney plus animated show incorporated into a movie of this scale i always love to see that kind of stuff up next we've got the big ones we have john krasinski as none other than mr fantastic himself and look um i think i personally have so much baggage in regard to this role that I would be lying if I told you I didn't have my guard up with this character more so than most other characters in the MCU. Second to only maybe Spider-Man, out of all of the characters that have been introduced into the MCU, the Fantastic Four in general is one that I feel incredibly protective over. I adore the Fantastic Four and I have been itching my entire life to see a great Fantastic Four movie. So when John Krasinski was revealed to be portraying Mr. Fantastic, my first reaction was I, I kind of winced a little bit. Krasinski is someone who fans have been really pulling for to portray Reed Richards for the longest time, and I've always found it kind of odd and a little misguided. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like Krasinski, but there's nothing about him that says or seems like Reed Richards to me, other than the fact that he's also a white guy and has a great beard, which Reed Richards sometimes has. To be fair, we don't really get to see that much of him in this movie. We don't get to see him interact with the other members of the Fantastic Four. And if fans have their way, which I suspect they may, Emily Blunt will probably be the MCU's Susan Richards. That remains to be seen, as does John Krasinski's performance as this character. So I will say with this movie, I think he's fine. He's okay. I don't know. I didn't really seem to like him to the degree that I thought it was like a home run or that he is super evocative of this character, right? But I don't know. I'll wait to see more before I make my final judgment. And last, but certainly not least, we have Sir Patrick Stewart returning as Professor X, something that we also knew we were going to be getting in this movie as a result of marketing. And he's been playing Professor X since the year 2000. I mean, Jesus Christ. Look, he's good. I love him as Professor X. It's one of the most defining roles of his career. But like I said, I don't want him to be the official Professor X of the MCU. I want to move on. I want him to move on. I loved those movies growing up, and Logan was an excellent movie and a perfect send-off for that interpretation of that character. So let's let it be that. But I will say this. It's very obvious, overtly obvious, in fact, that Charles Xavier in this film is clearly paying homage to the X-Men animated series, so much so, in fact, that he not only has the same yellow hover chair, but when he enters, he literally comes out to a modern rendition of the animated series theme. And dude, if that is the direction the MCU is going and is being influenced by that series, hell yes. Please give me comic book accurate X-Men. Frankly, even more reason to let that older cast move on from those roles. Give me comic book accurate Wolverine, Cyclops, Storm, Jean Grey, Kitty Pride, Gambit, Beast, all of those guys. That series, the X-Men animated series, is being rebooted, and I would not be surprised at all if that series is kind of like a testing ground for what they want to eventually incorporate into the MCU. See what works with modern audiences, what doesn't work. But if that is a hint about the type of MCU we can expect to see, dude, Fuck yeah, sign me up. So on the whole, I think the cameos in this movie were kind of a mixed bag for me, as was the entire film. I think stylistically, I loved what Raimi did with this movie. I was worried his vision and directorial flair would be muted in favor of something a bit more traditional, but it's not, that not at all, in fact. This is a full-blown Sam Raimi movie, and it is 
all the better for it. This is through and through a comic book movie, and I mean that in the very literal sense. A lot of the dialogue that is in this film feels like it is ripped straight out of the pages of a comic book panel you know, for better or worse, because a lot of the dialogue in this movie is mostly just kind of like exposition or just comic book mumbo jumbo, which results in an incredibly pulpy and very genre heavy and stylistic experience but also one that I think is lacking from a character perspective. I think the film doesn't quite dive as deep into these characters as maybe it could or should, and when it does, it pretty much just kind of treads ground that has already been covered in prior material, which makes this film just uh, kind of a mixed bag for me. But I think in the future, I am going to be able to enjoy this just as a kind of a fun ride and a distinct ride at that. And I think the fact that I do want to go see this movie again is positive because frankly, that's just not really something that I can say for a lot of Marvel movies, most recent output. But I want to know what you guys thought of this movie. Let me know down below what you think of this film, where it ranks in your MCU ranking. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching today. I hope you liked today's video. And if you did, click that link down below so you can subscribe to my channel, see more movie reviews and movie related things. Again, guys, thank you so much for watching and see you next time.